The fourth episode of Star Trek Picard, titled Absolute Candor, finally sees the former captain take to the stars, building up his ragtag crew as he searches for answers about Data's twin daughters. From notable historical figures to nods to previous Star Trek episodes, here are the Easter eggs you missed. Prior to the synthetic attack on Mars 14 years earlier, Picard was visiting an order of Romulan assassin nuns called the Coat Milot on the planet Vashti. The Coat Milot are also caring for a young boy named Elnar, a refugee Picard entrusted to the order until a more suitable home can be found for him. Despite Picard's notorious distaste for children, he has a soft spot for Elnor and brings the boy a copy of Alexander Dumas' The Three Musketeers. Picard reads the book aloud to Elnor, and the two of them enthusiastically enact some of its more energetic fencing scenes before Picard receives the tragic news about Mars. While The Three Musketeers is a popular tale that is referenced numerous times in Star Trek history, the book plays a significant role in the Next Generation episode, Hollow Pursuits, in which a crew member of the Enterprise creates a holodeck program in which Picard, Data, and Geordi play the Three Musketeers, with Riker joining later on as a diminutive D'Artagnan. In Hollow Pursuits, the Musketeer version of Picard challenges the real-life Riker to a duel, but when Riker refuses, saying he has no sword and doesn't want to fight, the virtual Picard taunts him. Do I detect a streak of yellow along the good fellow's back? <laughs> Later, in absolute candor, Picard will be challenged to a duel, throw down his sword, and refuse to fight. Early on in absolute candor, Dr. Agnes Girati wanders onto the bridge, desperate for some conversation to take her mind off the boredom and monotony of space travel. When Rios seems reluctant to talk, Girati runs through a list of the things she's already done to occupy her time complaining that she was going to watch a hollow, but all he has on board is Klingon opera. While we're definitely curious what the story is behind Rios's Klingon opera collection, the unpleasantness of Klingon opera is a long-running joke in Star Trek. Characters from multiple Star Trek iterations have repeatedly likened listening to Klingon opera as a form of torture. So here you were, ready to have a nice night watching the Caronet match, and you wind up spending an agonizing evening listening to Klingon opera. <laughs> However, on both Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, Worf had a great love for Klingon opera and prided himself on his extensive Klingon opera collection. And you're afraid that I might lose your precious operas? Yes. Worf was even known to occasionally break out in song himself if he thought no one was listening. Rios's Klingon opera Hollows might indicate that he and Worf share a similar taste in music, or possibly that sometime before Rios's crew consisted entirely of holographic versions of himself, the La Sirena may have been home to yet another Klingon music aficionado. When Narek asks Soji how she speaks such excellent Romulan, she says she learned it from a friend of her father, who was a professor. Narek observes that she must have learned it prior to May of 2396, when her records say that she shipped out to the Beta Quadrant aboard the Ellison. Most of the ships mentioned in Star Trek have some sort of deeper significance, and the Ellison is no exception. The ship is likely named for Harlan Ellison, an influential and prolific writer who passed away in 2018. One of Ellison's best-known works was the Star Trek episode The City on the Edge of Forever, which is widely considered one of the original series' finest episodes, although Ellison famously insisted that the episode that aired was drastically different than the one he'd written and that he did not approve of the changes. I felt that uh, they had mucked it up badly, and uh, it took, I think, six or seven years before Gene Roddenberry even, and I even spoke to each other again after the show. In the episode, McCoy accidentally travels back in time to 1930s New York and inadvertently alters history, and Kirk and Spock then follow him in order to restore the timeline. Ellison won several awards for his writing on the episode, including a Hugo Award, and The City on the Edge of Forever is still cited as one of the best Star Trek episodes of all time. When Picard beams down to the Romulan relocation settlement on the planet Vashti in absolute candor, he's unprepared for the frosty welcome he receives from its inhabitants. One man confronts Picard, saying he recalled when Picard came to Romulus with great big Wallenberg-class transports to help relocate the Romulan people to safety. Wallenberg-class transports are a new type of ship in the Star Trek universe and are likely named for Raoul Wallenberg a Swedish diplomat credited with saving tens of thousands of Jewish people in Nazi-occupied Hungary during World War II. 
It's an apt name for transports designed to carry people to safety in the face of extinction, although also a tragic one, given the Federation's abandoning of their rescue efforts shortly thereafter. Wallenberg's story was turned into the television film Wallenberg, A Hero's Story, in 1985, which was overseen by Rick Berman, who served as executive producer for numerous Star Trek series and films including The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. In absolute candor, the specific Wallenberg-class ship that the former Romulan senator says he boarded during the evacuation of Romulus was named the Nightingale. Of course, this ship is an obvious reference to Florence Nightingale, the 19th century woman who is commonly credited as being the founder of modern nursing. Nightingale was also the name of an episode of Star Trek Voyager, in which Ensign Harry Kim takes command of a Kralor medical transport, which he renames the Nightingale. Nightingale. The name of someone from my home world. She was famous for treating wounded soldiers on the battlefield. Kim believes he is helping the Kralor transport vaccines to their home world, but eventually finds out that their actual mission is to transport a group of Kralor scientists and their prototype of a cloaking device to their planet in violation of the Prime Directive. In absolute candor, the Romulans are angry at Picard, believing that he willfully deceived and took advantage of the Romulan people during a time when they were most vulnerable. While in the Nightingale episode of Voyager, it is Kim, representing the Federation, who was deceived. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about Star Trek are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.